Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tyree Haley. I'm one of NSCC's recruitment coordinator. Uh, happy African Heritage Month, and I'd like to welcome you all to our third annual Ask a Black Entrepreneur series. We have ASL interpretation and captions and subtitles. Um, we will be asking, we will be wanting to get questions from you answered uh, by some of the panelists, uh, the audience. So click ask a question in the bottom right of your screen to submit your question. All questions that are not answered during today's live event will be collected and answered at a later time. Today we have four special panelists who are all NSCC alumni and have their own business uh, operated by themselves. Uh, before we go into introducing each panelist, I'd like to invite Joe Provo, Vice President, Academics and Equity, to say a few words to open our event today. Hello, Joe. Hello. Oh, Ty, thank you so much for the introduction. I appreciate it, and hello to everybody. Um, so as Ty mentioned, my name is Jill Provo, and on behalf of Nova Scotia Community College and our executive team, I want to wish you a very warm welcome to our third annual, as Ty said, panel called Ask a Black Entrepreneur. So I would like to begin um, with an acknowledgement. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki the unceded ancestral territory and traditional homeland of the Mi'kmaq Nation. Our relationship is based on a series of peace and friendship treaties between the Mi'kmaq Nation and the Crown dating back to 1725. In Nova Scotia, we recognize that we are all treaty people. As a treaty beneficiary, I also want to personally state the significance of this acknowledgement from my perspective as a biracial woman with lineages to the Black Nova Scotian community. I also come from a displaced people and I feel compelled to show my profound respect to local Indigenous and African Nova Scotian communities. Although there are differences, there is a deep interconnectedness between the Mi'kmaq people and the historic African Nova Scotian community. Our struggles are intertwined. We share much pain from a past inflicted with racism and violence against our people. And so for that reason, I do a land acknowledgement in recognition of the harms of the past and equally as important to recognize the impact this history continues to have on us today. Divisions within and between our communities only further supports colonialism, in my opinion, and that separation means we lose access, we lose power, and we lose voice. So I therefore ask all of you here today with us as treaty beneficiaries to not only go back and read again and reflect on the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but to do something in solidarity to take action because we need to ask ourselves what it means to unite and become true allies and it most certainly requires us to do our part to break down barriers even when that work is hard and hostile to ensure we stand together in pursuit of systemic change. We are all treaty people. So as we move through this session, I would like us to remain cognizant of being on unceded colonized Mi'kmaq territory which has left Mi'kmaq people as well as other people of color and marginalized groups disproportionately impacted by racism, discrimination, and related trauma. Let's keep this in mind as we work together to disrupt barriers in striving for a more equitable Nova Scotia. And please, let's never forget that we are better together than we are apart. I thank you for the acknowledgement. And just before I hand the floor back to you, Tyree, um, I do just want to say a few quick words um, before we begin the panel to let you know that here at NSCC, um, I assure you that we are serious about our work in fighting anti-Black racism and in striving for equity. It is our third annual event. We are committing, committed to um, honoring African Heritage Month and the contributions of Black people all year round, not just in February. I'm very proud, last year we hired our first um, senior advisor, Black and African Nova Scotian Initiatives. Shout out to Sean Smith. We have a brand new Black Advisory Community Council to provide wisdom and guidance to support Black student success. We do want to do better in order to do different. Last thing I'll say, I promise, um, the province's theme this year is Seas of Change. African people from shore to shore recognizes the resiliency, the strength, the determination we have as people of African descent from the shores of Africa to the shores of Nova Scotia. We know um, we have more than 50 historic African Nova Scotian communities in this province with a long and deep complex history dating back more than 400 years. Last thing is we also have been very intentional in promoting entrepreneurship and dedicated staff like Sherry Williams and others um, have been doing great work here. We're seeing results. Students are coming to us looking to be entrepreneurs and together I feel Ty, we bring it all together by intentionally supporting black excellence, 
which all of our panelists here represent. We've asked them to be frank about their experiences. So after you hear about the barriers, the challenges and opportunities they face, please, we need you to go out of your way to support black business owners in Nova Scotia as one example of something you can do in pursuit of equity. We're looking for people to unite with us to be in this fight for racial justice. And please, we are all accountable. This is everyone's work. This is everyone's business. Please make it yours. Um, on that note, I'm now gonna hand the floor back over to you, Tyree. Um, who again made this event happen today and to introduce our guests, Sabrina, Glenn, Nathan, and Tia. Again, all graduates of NSCC, and thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Jill. It means so much, and I know the college is very, very thankful to have you um, leading us. Uh, at NSCC, celebrating African Heritage Month is very important, and this year we are so excited and happy to be hosting the third annual Ask a Black Entrepreneur Series. We want to showcase some of our very own entrepreneurs in our communities doing great things and wanted to give them a platform to discuss their stories and provide insight on taking the necessary steps to turn their passion into a business. Today, we have four panelists. Each will be asked a series of questions directed to their personal journey. We are more than welcome. You are more than welcome to submit questions to be added at the end when we have time. And you can write your questions in the chat or you can click ask a question uh, in the top bottom corner. Um, we will try our best to answer as many questions as we can as we go. Um, so, but if we don't answer your question, we will answer it at a later time. Also, students and graduates of NSCC who complete the feedback survey after today's session, which will be entered in the chat, will be entered to uh, a draw for four for uh, door prizes. We are giving away two alumni gift boxes filled with local items from graduate powered businesses and a book written by an award-winning alumni author, Andre Fenton. This survey will be posted in the chat for you to fill out and submit at the end. So before we get into asking the questions, I wanna give each entrepreneur a moment to tell the audience a little bit about themselves. Uh, I will start with Tia. Thirteen marvelous employees loved them to death, and oh, someone said they couldn't hear me. Can you? Guys? Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, happy Black History Month. Um, T. Upshaw here. I'm a serial entrepreneur, uh, mother of three, and most of you guys know me as the CEO and founder of Black Women in Excellence, which we call BWIE. Um, several different businesses I've had, um, ranging over a 10 year time span, um, 13 lovely employees. And, you know, I'm just doing what feels good to me uh, in the black community. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Tia. I'm going to hand it over to Glenn. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy uh, Black History Month. My name is Glenn Carvey and I own Carvey's Construction Limited and I'm also an owner of CGR Mechanical. We've been in business since 1990. Uh, we're, we, I went to the Halifax Vocational School back in 1986 and today I operate Carvey's Construction that employs approximately 70 people and CGR Mechanical employs 20 people. And I'm glad to be part of this today and looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Glenn. Uh, I'll hand it over to Sabrina next. Hi, my name is Sabrina Allison. I'm the owner, photographer, videographer at Alice Photography. I've been in business for five years and I'm very happy to be here participating in this event. And I'm, I have to say that I am, I started going to NSCC when I 
retired after working 34 and a half years with the public service. So I am very happy for being a um, mature, older student. And I'm living my best life right now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sabrina. And last but certainly not least, Nathan. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for uh, having me be a part of this. Um, I am owner of Back to Bel Air Vintage Wear, um, a company that I started about four years ago that specializes in everything that you can think of that is vintage from sports to music, hats, sneakers. Um, that's that's basically my child right now. Um, I also co-own Simon Seamoss with my wife, who's also an NSCC alumni, Shayla Simon, and now a part of the NSCC team herself. So um, definitely want to say thank you so much for having us be a part of this and, uh, you know, definitely excited to, uh, you know, answer some questions. Thank you so much, Nathan. Uh, we're so excited to have all of you here today, especially it's really important that you guys have all been at NSCC as a student at once upon a time. Now you guys are doing great things, uh, owning and operating your own businesses. So personally, thank you so much for being here. So I'm going to ask each of you a series of four questions and I'll take turns. Uh, the first question that I have will go to uh, Sabrina. Um, what has influenced you to start your own business and become an entrepreneur? In May of what influenced me to become a, um, an entrepreneur, I started my business in May 2015. I decided to follow my passion and, um, and I registered my business. But it was in 2019 after I retired that I, I followed, um, sorry. In 2019, I attended NSCC to study professional photography. And while I was sitting in class one day, I think I was in the entrepreneurial class. And then I started thinking about it. I said, oh my God, I'm learning sales and marketing. I'm learning all about social media. I'm writing a business plan, um, business communications and all that. I said, I'm sitting on a pot of gold. This is so much information. Why not put it to use instead of just going in and studying photography? So it was there that I decided to start my own business and work for myself and um i love it so that's what influenced that's what influenced me thank you sabrina and i also think it's so cool and special that you went back to school uh, as a mature student i think that shows great initiative that to show people that it's never too late and you can always make a change and follow your passion um no matter where you are in life so thank you so much. Uh, my next question will be for Tia. Uh, what advice would you give black students studying full time to start taking the necessary steps uh, to start up their business while being a student? <sighs> when I get asked that question often, it's almost like, OK, what am I going to tell these individuals? Because I get asked that a lot. Um, the first thing I would say would be, you know, a smart time management. If you're a full time student, and starting a business, that is going to be complicated. It's going to be a lot of sleepless nights, long days. Um, so you want to have a time management that's realistic to your lifestyle. Don't go on Google and Google time management schedule. That doesn't work for you. You're just setting yourself up to be overwhelmed, to be burdened, and then burnout. Um, now, here's the fun part. You have to do market research. Do not pick a market based on popularity and what's trending and what's in. Don't do that. Pick something that you have a passion for and research the market for indirect competitors and direct competitors and see if it could be lucrative for you to see if it can be extensive enough for your source of income. Secondly, you're going to have to do your marketing plan. Then you have to do your business plan. I know everybody hates that. I get a lot of pushback doing like during my cohorts. People think even the creatives who are artists think they don't have to have a business plan. You have to have one um, and not just to get capital or grants. You need to have a plan so you know where you're going to go in five to ten years with your business. And last but not least, guys, them good old financial projections. You got to get the good old financial projections. Um, but, you know, all in all, even with those things that sound so daunting, um, once you manage your time uh, realistically and set yourself up for success on your own terms, 
you'll be successful. Thank you, Tia. Um, I really like uh, the idea of time management and doing the research. I think that that is so important because we all have the same amount of time in the day to accomplish and do what we need to do. Um, it's just how you manage that time is what's going to separate you um, from being a successful business owner. So thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah, my next question. Thank you. Thank you. My next question is for Nathan. Um, so during your time at NSCC as a student, what valuable tools did you take away from your program to start your own business? Um, while at NSCC, I, I ended up taking marketing and uh, graduating with a marketing diploma there. And uh, definitely one thing I would say is, is you definitely have to learn how to uh, grow and foster your relationships as well. Um, a lot of time people, I know everybody's heard this, it's not who you know, or it's not what you know, but it's who you know. So you really got to build on the relationships and uh, build on yourself as well. A lot of people come into uh, presenting a product and that's all they think about is presenting that product and selling the features on the product. And what I really learned is sometimes you need to present yourself and the features of who you are. So if you can build a relationship of, OK, I now know who Nathan is and what he stands for and what he's about. After people know that and they can trust you and believe in what you have to offer. You know, that's it. You know what I mean? So I really felt that that was important. Um, what Tia said as well, how to market effectively. I made a lot of mistakes uh, in the beginning, you know, looking at exactly what she said, looking at other companies and what they were doing and trying to emulate that in my own business. And it didn't work for me. And it, it, it's really difficult. It's, it's, it's one, something that everybody has to learn. But once I found what worked for me and, you know, found out the market that I wanted to go in in my niche, everything, all the doors started to open after that. So that was huge for me. And uh, I think as an entrepreneur as well, you have to you have to be a critical thinker. You, you have to learn how to, you know, think on the fly, problem solve on the fly and, uh, you know, present solutions, you know, right away. So I feel like those three things are probably three of the biggest things that I've learned through, through my time at NSCC. Thank you for that, Nathan, and uh, I, I couldn't agree more. And I'm pretty sure your business is so unique that it's the only business like itself mm -hmm. east of Montreal, if I'm not correct. So I think, that I think that's I'm the very... only one. I think I'm the only one in the largest black owned vintage company in Atlanta, Canada. Yeah, and I must say I'm a big fan of, of your of uh, your clothing and stuff. So, you know, keep thank doing you. what you're doing and thank you so much for that. Um, the you. next question I have is for Glenn. Um, Glenn, how do you find balance between running your own business as an entrepreneur and dealing with personal life? Uh, one of the things that I work on when it comes to running my business and dealing with per personal is um, I manage my time, you know, and one of the things in managing your time is, you know, you, you got to set priorities and then, you know, create a schedule. You know, you want to know, you know, from one day to the next, you know, what you're doing in the run of a day at work versus what you're doing personal. Um, you know, time management is is so huge in business to make things run smoothly and efficiently. Um, you know, eliminate the distractions because, you know, as you know, in time management, there's distractions with personal that, you know, you got to leave that outside the door when you're going to work. You know, another, another issue would be, you know, creating those boundaries. You know, you want to know, like, when it comes to, Excess in situations, whether it's personal or business, you know, you got to know that separation, right? And, you know, with that, you know, be protective of your health. You know, I mean, uh, you know, in from, you know, especially with work, work can be stressful. It's all about, you know, with time management, you have to basically be able to, you know, step back when you have certain issues at work and be able to, you know, set that boundary from getting too stressed over what is at hand in front of you versus, you know, how you're going to deal with it from the personal side to the business side. You know, one other thing, you know, you got to learn to say no. Like there's sometimes in business you can't do everything. You can't, I mean, as much as you like to help everybody and and be able to deliver for everybody, you got to learn to say no because sometimes you get overwhelmed, take on too much, and you want to keep everybody happy. You got to learn to have be able to say that no, you know, which would create, you know, it's tough to do, but it's something that have to, as you grow, you need to be able to learn to be able to say no. 
Um, one of the things, you know, when it comes to like social media, you got to be able to handle uh, with respect to social media because there's a lot, people say a lot on social media. You got to separate the personal to the business side of things. Um, you know, have separate accounts from your personal side to your business side. Don't don't mix that. You know, it's a bad mix. Keep that separate and, you know, because everybody's going to talk about what you're doing and, you know, oh, this guy did this and, you know, they're not a good company. Just keep it separate. Just, you know, be on the business like LinkedIn. Um, you know, there's, you know, push your, you know, if you're looking for somebody, don't put it on Facebook, put it on Indeed. Just be more professional on that side of things with the social side of things, right? Um, you know, which is it's so important to keep that separation because like I say, it can get, you can get caught up into it, right? So um, the other thing is, is, you know, uh, if you're working from home, I mean, in my business, I can do some things from home, but, uh, you know, you gotta, if you're working from home, you gotta get up in the morning, get dressed, you know, be professional. Like, you know, I mean, you know, you don't wanna be in sweats, you know, put a shirt and tie on, you know, I mean, even though you're working from home, you gotta feel like you're going to work, you know? Um, and then one of the things is, you know, take your breaks, you know, um, you know, don't do your housework while you're home, supposed to be working from home. You know, just certain simple things like that. Just create it, you know, create it so that as if you're actually getting up, going outside the house and going to work at your place of work. But if you're going to do it at home, you got to have that, you have that separation to make sure you feel, feel like you're going to work and, and take it as a whole. But outside of that, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, between the business and personal side, that separation needs to be there in order to be successful and to be able to carry on in a professional basics. Thank you so much, Glenn. I love the idea of setting boundaries for yourself. Uh, I think that's so important and, and having the discipline to uh, get up and, and get dressed every day, even though you're working from home, uh, because now after the pandemic, a lot of people are um, able to work from home and, and that can be very uh, daunting on, on not getting things done that you need to do on a regular basis. So thank you for much. Thank you so much for that. And I know your business specifically has been around the longest out of um, the four entrepreneurs. Um, so I know it, it, it has taken a lot for you to get to where you're at. So thank you so much for that. Uh, my next question is uh, for Sabrina. What advice would you give uh, a fellow NSCC alumni who wants to start their own business? Uh, what steps would you recommend that they take to achieve that? For the um, NSCC alumni, the advice I would give if you want to start your own business is to do your market research, um, research their price their, and do one on the competitors. Um, I am so nervous, I apologize. So I'll have to start this again and okay. So for anyone who's an NSCC alumni and you want to start your own business, first of all, I would advise you to do a market research to see if your products are, product services are needed in the area. The other thing you can do is check out your competitors, check out their prices, um, their services, how they deliver and who their clients are. Next, you can do a SWOT analysis, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats. Do one on them, do one on yourself. Um, write a business plan. You can also um, network and build relationships with people um, who are already serving your ideal clients, but you have to know who your ideal clients are. And um, don't stress yourself out, make sure you get proper rest. And the other thing that's really important is never stop learning. Commit at least 30 minutes to an hour a day to learn to learning something new, whether it's a new piece of equipment, a new trend or whatever, just do that. Um, work hard, be prepared not to, um, when you open your business, be prepared not to get paid. It would be best if you could take that money and put it, invest it back into your company. And I think that's about it. Like I said, get plenty of rest and if you need help, oh, one more thing, find a mentor, find someone that will really um, point out your weaknesses, but all, and then with your strengths, just someone that will encourage you and someone who's going to be honest with you and let you know where you are 
and if you're going down the wrong road or you to do this, you do something else. But it's important to have a mentor and also believe in yourself because your journey will be different from someone else's journey. And yeah, if that's it. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Um, I really love that answer. And, and a lot of people think that they can just start a business and start making money right away. And like, that's not the case. And that's why I think it's so important to find something that you truly love that you can uh, do regardless if you get paid. Because if you have that passion, you know that that money is eventually going to come there after you put the hard work in. Uh, I love the idea of having a mentor, especially someone who has been successful and has done uh, what you strive to do. I think that's so important and that um, you really need to, to find uh, that. Uh, my next question is for Glenn. Uh, Glenn, what are some ways you were able to find funding to start up your business in the early stages? When it comes to respect to starting my business, uh, some of the ways that I looked at when uh, looked trying to, trying to create funding for my business was you know, I looked at my savings accounts, you know, I mean, I, when I first started, there wasn't much there, but, you know, what I did have, I took every cent I had to actually start my business. I remember um, I've got a small business loan from uh, Bill Owen before Black, uh, BBI was created. Uh, there was a small black business loan from the uh, business center over in Cambridge Suites. So they supported, there was a small little article in the paper saying that they were going to support black entrepreneurs by uh, giving up to $10,000 to get started. So that was one of the avenues that I did actually, you know, follow up on and uh, and receive $10,000 to get started. But because of where I was, uh, whether I was, I wasn't brought up in the black communities, I was in the city, you know, I had to pay half of it back. So you, you were able to keep half and which was a great deal to get started. And, uh, but it was a good help. Um, other things I looked at, I looked at any personal credit that I had. If I had a some, you know, if I had a credit card, you know, I'd use a little bit of that to to, to fund my company. Um, which you know, not everybody has a personal credit card, but I did at that time. Um, with a small, you know, I only had a small amount on it, but it still was helpful. Um, other things I did is I I leaned on some of my suppliers. I knew I was just starting, but one thing I did, I reached out to as many suppliers as possible that would help my business and I basically spoke to them and you know begged and plead and asked you know can I get a small you know line of credit with respect to supplies and you know give me shorter terms so that I could show that you know what you know if it's if it's 10 days or 15 days you know any little bit kind of helped so I, I reached out to as many people as I could on that respect um, other things I looked at you know um, you know Buying a vehicle was different than leasing a vehicle. In my business, I need vehicles to do service work. So, you know, I leased a couple of vehicles, which um, in some cases back then, it was a little bit easier to lease a vehicle um, because it was almost like renting uh, to get started in the business. So just different avenues like that. I tried to uh, go to resources, as much suppliers and supply, uh, suppliers and customers and trying to reach out as much credit as I could possibly get to get my venture off the ground. And, you know, it worked for me and, uh, you know, not everybody has those resources, but I've used about five different resources in order to get started to, to get a bit of funding. Thank you so much, Glenn. And I, I'd like to say uh, it really shows resilience from you because I feel like there's so much more resources available now uh, to the black community for finding funding and getting help with that. A lot more information is available. So um, for anybody interested in, in finding funding, you know, don't be shy. Uh, please reach out. You can reach out to uh, NSEC and get in contact with me. I can definitely uh, recommend uh, some things that I know uh, through the BBI or Delmore Buddy Day or anything to help you uh, start your business. So don't let money be something that uh, holds you back from doing what you really want to do. Uh, my next question is for Nathan. Uh, Nathan, what are three essential skills you must possess to be a successful entrepreneur and why? Um, I think one main one is uh, the ability to communicate. I find that, uh, and this is something that I'm still working on, um, but communication is key. You know, when you're out in the work world and you know you have you know your day set up or your plan set up, 
Um, you know, you get your blinders on and you continue to do what you're doing and then you look at your phone and you forget to reply to your emails or your text or, you know, the communication is lost. And, you know, that's something that, you know, I found over the years that I that has been really, really helpful is communicating with your employees better, communicating with your your vendors and your suppliers. Those are all things that that are, are, are really key in being an entrepreneur and uh, building that relationship there. Um, the other thing is I think we all need to, to have the ability to learn as well. And uh, I say that because uh, learning from your failures is probably the biggest piece of advice that you can have as an entrepreneur because it's, it's probably the most daunting as well because nobody likes to make mistakes and no one likes to do things wrong. But um, I found in my life I was comparing a lot of my failures to someone else's success. And, you know, I'm growing up in the social media area or era, so we're seeing a lot of different things on Instagram and Facebook. And you're like, you, you want to go from the start line to the finish line quicker than ever. All right. But you're not seeing everybody's path to, su to success. Right. So, you know, you really, really have to look at that and not compare what you're doing wrong to what someone else has done correctly because you don't know what their path is like and all the hurdles and barriers that they, they've had to go through, right? So I, I think that's a huge thing for me is, is, is learning, having the ability to learn and then learning to be different as well and learning from your, your mistakes. So those are, those are huge for me. Um, one that Sherry mentioned as well is uh, sur surrounding yourself with a mentor. And uh, I've been lucky enough as a, as a young entrepreneur to have people around me uh, that have established businesses like, you know, Robert Lopi, my wife's dad. He's huge and he's been a huge factor in helping me um, be successful in my businesses and just watching him over the years, as well as Jason Valancourt, watching them over the years, you know, build their business and do what they do. Um, it, it's helped me a lot to say, OK, this is what I need to do. And, and they've been basically the model for me on how to how to conduct business. And even even someone like Glenn, I've watched Glenn a lot. You know, I used to hang with his sons when when I was younger, Glendale, and just seeing his his evolution throughout the years, you know, doing what he's done. And now, like, you know, one of the biggest in the entire city and then the province, really. And, you know, that's huge, you know, to see guys like that that look like me and, you know, being so successful. So those things are, are, are big, big for myself. So um, those are probably be the, the things that I would say as far as, you know, essential skills that you would need to have in being successful as an entrepreneur. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nathan. I really love that answer. And I, I really think that like it's important to know that, um, you know, there are people out there that, um, you know, that you can learn from and that you can look up to and use as resources and um, mentors. And I think that's so important to be able to do. Uh, I really like the idea of keeping your blinders on. I mean, we are in a social media age where there's mm -hmm. so much distractions and a lot of people uh, only post the good, you know, they don't post the post bad. The and you, <laughs> yeah. And you can never compare yourself uh, to other people because everybody, you know, is going through their own journey and, you know, you just got to stay the course. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for that. And communicating communication is uh, very vital. You know, you, you don't have to be a really outgoing person, but you're going to know how to communicate and how to exactly. connect with people. 100%. So those were those were excellent. Nathan. Thank you so much for that, brother. Thank you. Um, my next question is for Tia. Sorry, Tia, we went, we, we, we uh, asked you the first question first and then you've been waiting and waiting. So no, I apologize I'm, about that. I know you've been itching to get in. Um, I was just so, Nathan, like I was like thumbing up because everything saying, I feel it, everything he was saying. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, I know we really love that answer, Nathan. Um, so my question for you, uh, Tia, is what are some of the resources you had to use within the black community to help you get your business up and running? Well, when I when I seen that question, I thought it was a trick question at first uh, because um, I, there wasn't any. Um, unfortunately, when I started, um, organizations in the black community were not there to help me. Um, I didn't know how to do a business plan. Um, I had bad credit. I was almost homeless and, you know, the doors were just shutting. Um, so there was nothing. And I would say one thing that did help me and Shayla was working there at the time, um, the YMCA on Goddard Street. And I went there to print off little posters to take door to door for my cleaning company. 
I was able to go there and check my email every day. I was able to print off stuff. Um, they just allowed me to use the center to start up my business. Um, but I guess it, it, it came in my favor because that's why I developed um, BWIE um, to, to fill that gap where black women um, are not able to have access to credit, access to education, access to mentors, access to you know things that even black men are ha able to have access to. We don't have access to it. Um, and it could be a part of you know it just not being there or we just don't know it's there. Uh, so for me, I mean, it kind of kind of went in my favor. My businesses are um, doing quite well, and um, I'm able to now pass that knowledge. And as Nathan said, um, you know, people post things on Facebook, they don't post it bad, but you need to go to my social media. I post it bad. I've been audited. I've been all that. So for me, I'm able to take all of my ups and downs through my businesses and put it back into my Black community to ensure that Black women don't have to have make the same mistakes I made. Thank you so much, Tia. And uh, from someone that that knows and looks up to you, like I know you're not scared to speak the truth and, and speak what you what you believe. And I think that's so important. Um, you know, especially being your own business owner, you don't want to be feel feel like you're put inside a certain box. And um, I think, yeah, I, I really love that. So the next two questions that we have, I'm going to spread them out around all the panelists to be able to answer. So I'll go from each panelist to to give their input on the questions. Um, I will start with uh, Sabrina. So the Sabrina, what I have for you is, um, what is the what is next for your entrepreneur journey? Where would like, where would you like to see your business in five years down the road? Okay, so what's next for my entrepreneur journey is this. I started off uh, just doing boudoir photography, and but since then I've been asked to do a couple of events um, and more portraits. And I've also done, um, and I'm really proud of this, my community, we were fundraising for uh, the Elizabeth Mantley Youth and Arts Recreation Center. Um, and I recorded a video and I was also photographing at the same time. Um, I had two cameras, so I was able to set up the uh, camera to do the video and also do the photography. But in saying all that, I loved it so much because when I was going to NSCC, I hated videography. But the finished product is what sold me on creating more videos. And I just finished another one. So um, long story short is that I will be um, entering into videography, doing more event photography, as well as fashion and boudoir. So in the next five years, I hope to see myself out, being known outside of the black community and perhaps, well, and known nationally uh, within the fashion and videography world. Thank you, Sabrina. And I think that's so cool. You're, you're gonna start doing videography and not just uh, photography. So that, that's really cool. You're gonna diversify um your um your work so the the next question I'll, well same question i'm going to ask glenn is uh what is next for your entrepreneurial journey uh where do you see your business in five years from now sorry about that guys um one of the where I see my where I see Carvey's construction and CGR mechanical in the next five years, um, one of the things over the years uh, we've gone from just a regular uh, non-union shop. Uh, we we've switched our company over to a full-fledged union shop in all trades. Um, in the next five years, we want to be a complete one 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 call stop. Like basically, we'll have every trade working for us. Uh, so basically, so we can serve our customers with one call. Um, so right now we're active in every union. We're just working a deal with the uh, Carpenters Union right now. Um, so our access for uh, people would be relatively a, lo a lot easier because you know they do a lot of the screening. People are part of the union, so we, we just make a phone call as we need bodies, which will then increase you know the amount of work we can do from 
you know, within the next five years. Um, one of the other things like, you know, we want to take a look at our customer base, you know, our revenue streams, you know, where most of the work is coming from of uh, in our sector, because as, as a union shop, you know, there's certain jobs that are just set as a union job, um, but we want to be one of the major players. Right now, we're our competitors. There's two major players out there that are kind of similar to us, but one of the good things about us is that we're not just a full-fledged construction company, nor are we just a full-fledged mechanical shop. We have all, all avenues working for us from all different trades. So we're kind of a, a select few, should I say. So basically, I, one of the things I want to be in the next five years, I want to be the largest construction company to offer all services as a union contractor. Good for you, Glenn. And I, I know I see Carvey construction trucks all the time. And whenever I see them, I feel so proud. And uh, it's, it's just so nice to see that. So. Um, Nathan, uh, where would you like, where, what's next for your entrepreneur journey and where would you like to see your businesses in the next five years? Um, ultimately, I'd like to see, and, and, and this is more for Simon Seamoss, um, we definitely want to try to scale that business up to try to get it into larger um, venues. So larger suppliers like Sobeys, Pete's, we're trying to, we're trying to, we're trying to get in there big time because um, feel with, with CMOS there's no one else doing it um, we, we, we found out that you know we're literally the only ones really that that are that are taking care of it in in Halifax Nova Scotia right so you know we're getting orders from all over the country now and we're, we're starting to look at okay can we make this something really big <laughs> so you know either from going wholesale or getting into larger retailers that that's that's going to be our goal for that and I, I think we're we're, we're right there. We just want to make sure that we have the product that we need and uh, we're, we're going to make some presentations very soon. So stay tuned in regards to that. Um, as far as back to Bel Air goes, um, I definitely want to try and, and, and open a storefront as well. Um, storefronts kind of scare me right now. Uh, you never know what's going on with this whole, you know, the world's a different place now. So um, I definitely want to make sure I have everything lined up, but um, Five years from now, I'd love to open a store or a creative space, not even just a store um, that sells clothes, does photography and an art gallery all in the same same place and, uh, you know, give it, you know, a place for people to kind of come together because that's that's what I really like to do. I like to see people come together and uh, have a multi purpose room so that, you know, we can have events there, bring our people together and have a good time. So it's it's it's. It's something that's on the list. I'm hoping it could happen like sooner than five years, but that's that's what I'm thinking right now. Wow, big things to come. And uh, I really love this the CMOS idea because, um, you know, a lot of people don't know the health benefits that CMOS provides. And uh, mm -hmm. I know when I was down uh, down south, I had some CMOS when I felt like I was getting a cold and yeah. it, it fixed me right up and I wasn't even mm -hmm. sick anymore. So uh, I'm really excited for that, uh, for what you have for both of your businesses uh, back to Bel Air as well. Uh, Tia, um, what's next for your entrepreneurial journey? Where would you like to see your businesses in the next five years? Ah, uh, uh, oh God. Um, well, firstly, with the cleaning company, I am entertaining um, pulling out my access strategy and my succession plan, which will be to my oldest daughter. Um, for the cleaning company and for the Airbnb business, I'm just, you know, going to take away the Airbnb and kind of flip it directly towards the, um, you know, marginalized, underrepresented, primarily black African, no, African Nova Scotians um, for affordable housing. And for my lipstick line, I'm just going to be adding more products, more colors, more, more tones, more just enrichments for black women. Um, and for BWIE, in five years, we will have, you know, a business hub, a safe place for black women to come do business plans, you know, have meetings, congregate, network with each other. Um, and I want to be the major player when it comes to working with black women in business through Canada. I love that. I love that, Tia. And I know so many black women in the community look up to you and, and um, idolize what you have going on. And, you're just such a great, powerful woman and nothing but love for you. Um, 
you. Oh, that's so sweet. I got you. I got you. Um, so the next question, uh, I'll ask Sabrina first, and this is going to be asked to everybody, of course. Um, where can we find and learn more about your business, Sabrina? So for my, photo I'm sorry, my boudoir photography, you can find me at www.alicephotography.com. Instagram handles are at underscore Alice underscore photography. From again on Instagram, from underscore my underscore eyes to yours. And also, um, I have another one. Oh, and you can call me at um, 90242. Sorry, I won't give out my phone number, but you can reach me on um, through one of those channels. And I look forward to working with uh, anyone who would wish to collaborate. And I'm going to be calling Nathan to see if we can collaborate. <laughs> plan. Thanks. Yeah, I, I love that because we're all one big community and we want to support and help each other. I think that that's the, the biggest takeaway from from this series is to know that, um, you know, you have people that are in your corner that want to support you and have your back. So thank you for that. I'm glad that you guys are going to connect. Uh, Glenn, where can we find and learn more about your business, brother? Um, one of the things you can find Carvery's Construction and CJ Mechanical. Um, we have our website uh, for Carvery's. It's www.carvery's.ca. Um, you know, we have the LinkedIn profile, which uh, anybody that's a member of LinkedIn, you can see us on there. We we do use for, for Facebook, so you will see some ads on Facebook for us. Um, we're, you know, we've got uh, number one rating from the Better Business Bureau. Uh, so if anybody wants to check up on our company to know, you know, what our workmanship's been like and, uh, you know, we got some great reviews there. Um, also, the Yellow Pages, we have a nice ad in there that's uh, basically for both companies. And nothing but better, you, our truck's driving up and down the road. We've got great advertising. We have 35 vehicles that says Carby's on the side and we have 15 vehicles that say CGR Mechanical on the side. Uh, which is great advertising. We get a lot. I get a lot of people can say, "Geez, I see. I just seen a coverage vehicle van get going the other day." You know, are you driving it? I said, "No, I'm not driving it." But you know, we're out there, so it's great advertisement. Um, you know, I have a link with uh, CIBC is a great supporter of us. Um, they did a nice uh, video on on my business and you know that we've used CIBC for our financing. Um, they so on their uh, their website www.cib cibc.com um, there's a nice video on there so um, so there's lots of areas where you'll find carries or CGR mechanical and we'll be glad to anybody to reach out to us at any given time awesome thank you so much Glenn it's funny because I've seen the truck uh, out in like Churro area and I was like wow like they, yeah. they're everywhere yeah. you know they're all throughout the province so that that's really amazing uh, Nathan where can we find and learn more about your businesses um, first off, uh, back to www.back to the number two, belair.com is my website. Um, also very present on Instagram at back to belair on Instagram as well. Um, Simon Seamoss at Simon Seamoss on Instagram or www.simonseamoss.com. Um, you can order all of our products through Simon Seamoss on that website. If you happen to be at any of the honey and ginger locations, you can also walk in there and pick up our products there. And if you're in the Bedford location, you can also walk into Luminant uh, health food store there, and they also sell our products there as well. Awesome, thank you so much, Nathan. And, and don't worry, audience as well, we're going to be posting all of this contact information down so you don't have to be writing it all down and you can just you know take it all in because we'll, we'll make sure that you get the information to reach out to each entrepreneur after if you'd like. Mm -hmm. um, Tia, where can we hear and learn more about your businesses? Well, thank God you're gonna write it down for them to see for later on. Um, <laughs> as I'm not gonna go, I have, I have three companies and an organization. Uh, but basically, to be able to find, you know, me and I can link you to everything, go to my LinkedIn page, um, Tia Upshaw. I am very active on LinkedIn, probably three to four times a day. You can go to Instagram, Black Women in Excellence, Google my name. Literally, there's a lot of articles out there. Um, you're able to find anything you want to find about Tia. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Tia. So now the formal questions are done. Now we're going to go and listen to the audience and some of the questions that were submitted for um, you guys. So I'm really interested to hear in your answer for some of these. I'm going to go through. I'm going to go in reverse order. So I'm going to start with you, Tia, first. But I want to hear from everybody. I have three questions that we're going to be able to get through, I think, um, to conclude this. Uh, so the question that I have for you, Tia, but it's also going to be for everybody is, um, have you ever had an instance where you had to deal with racism as an entrepreneur and how did it affect how you um, pursued your career? Well, yes, absolutely. I deal with racism and discrimination every single day, darling. Um, there was one instance that just happened recently at a financial institution. Um, I won't say the financial institution, but it is my financial institution, if anybody knows what bank I use. And I went in there with $5,000 check um, to deposit, not cash, from one of my clients. And I didn't go to my branch. And when I went there, they put the check up to the light. Um, they called the manager over. Um, they called a regional manager over, two staff people looking at this check. They asked me for every piece of ID I ever had in my wallet. Um, and I've been with this bank 10 years. Um, I, did, I didn't go in there looking like this. I know it doesn't matter but I didn't go in looking like this. I had on my my Jordans, I had on a hat, and I had a jogging suit on. So I did not look like a businesswoman. Um, and they literally did not do anything with my check. They literally would not. Um, so I took the check back, went to my branch. I walk into my branch. And keep in mind, my branch is like a half hour away from my host. The original branch was two minutes from my host. So anyway, went to my original branch, go in there, and I see people I don't know. Instant anxiety here we go again um, but sure enough that branch is educated on diversity equity and inclusion and they didn't look at me they just looked at my account records and they literally deposited a check within five minutes and said can i help you with anything else miss upshaw um i did go back to that other branch the next day with my white pantsuit on and all dolled up and they did not know who i was you guys the very next day i went back to that branch with a white dress suit on and they had no idea I was the woman from the day before. So to answer your question, absolutely. And I just, you know, for me, I built up that tough skin. And um, if anybody knows me, uh, a lot of things don't bother me easy. And I just keep pushing. I just keep being in spaces that they don't want to see me in um, to make them uncomfortable because I'm not being uncomfortable no more. Wow, well, well said, Tia. Thank you so much for that. Um, Nathan, same question, and I'll uh, mm -hmm. repeat it just to remind you. Um, have you ever had an instance where you had to deal with racism as an entrepreneur, and how did it affect how you pursued your career? Um, you know, I think being black in Nova Scotia, you know, we've all experienced, you know, racism from an early age, from an early age, almost so much so that we we kind of tend to just brush it off of our shoulders sometimes. But it's there. It's there all the time. Um, I post a lot on Instagram, a lot of my products and things like that. And uh, I bought a bracelet. I don't know if you can see it. It's a Black Lives Matter bracelet, BLM. I got it about two years ago when you know everything was going on. It was you know it's still bad, but this was in the forefront of uh, you know the news and everything. And I was taking a lot of pictures with this bracelet, so you could see it in the pictures when I was holding certain items. And uh, the amount of followers that I lost by just showing this bracelet, right? And, you know, it's indirect racism. It's not something that bothered me because obviously I'm still wearing the bracelet. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't bother me at all, but it's it, it's definitely there. Um, I've, I've had people inbox me saying that it's a cult, you know, so those are the kinds of things, you know, I'm not going to support you because you're you're part of a cult. You know, I don't see this as being a cult. Um, I could care less, really, because I'm going to wear this until I can't wear it anymore. It's it, it is who I am. And black lives do matter. And I firmly believe that. And, uh, you know, so every single day, you know, I, I think there's there's some form of racism that that we that we do face. And uh, it happens a lot of the time. And with being the only black, you know, vintage vendor, I talk to a lot of people before they see me. And then when I when when they do see me, I feel you know a little bit of a change in what they who they thought they were talking to versus who they're actually speaking to and who I actually am. So, 
you know, it is what it is. You know, it, it doesn't bother me at all. I, I'm unapolog uh, unapologetically black. That's that's not something that's ever going to change. It is who I am, and you know, it's it, it's something that that's going to probably continue to happen. You know, that's just the reality of it. But um, like from the beginning, that um, uh, Joe said, you know, we're stronger together than we are, you know, separated. So you know, we got to keep that going, and you know, stand up for each other all the time, and you know, that, that that's that's how it has to be, really. Yeah, I love that. And I love how you just kept the bracelet on because I mean, I mean, like you don't really need those followers. You don't need no. people, you know, in, involved with your business who deep down don't, you know, share the same beliefs that you feel uh, when it comes to these kind of things. And I think like being so resilient is so important. Um, Glenn, uh, same question for you. Um, have you ever had an instance where you had to deal with racism as as an entrepreneur in your business and how did it affect how you uh, pursued your career? Well, with respect to me dealing with racism in my business over, it's been over a decade, I mean, 35 years, uh, something that we deal with every day. One of the things with racism, I've learned to deal with it as a strength, you know, because, you know, uh, like Nathan say, you walk in a place or they see on a video that actually who they're talking to, um, the, the look on their faces changes because, you know, I mean, you know, I'm pretty careful how I speak to my clients and know, and I know my products. So, you know, it's a clearly understanding what they think they're talking to somebody, but when you get to the meeting, uh, you know, just look in their face. But yet, you know, me as a business person, I want the, I want the work, I want to get the contract. So, you know, unfortunately, I, I overlook that or like you say, brush it off and carry on. And you know, to me, I want to, I want to employ my people. I want to keep them busy. So. Uh, we try to move ahead with it, use it as a strength, um, try to carry the meeting on as if uh, it's not happening, but it's something that, you know, you deal with every day, whether it's, you know, two or three times a week, but uh, it's out there. Uh, but unfortunately, in order for you to be successful uh, in Nova Scotia, in Canada, really in general, you have to, you have to get to learn to, to kind of fight over that barrier and, and learn to grow in other ways and use it as a kind of as a strength. And that's how I deal with it. And like I say, I can sit here and talk about all kinds of different occasions of where it actually happened, but we'd be here all afternoon. Um, but yet it, it does happen and it's on a regular basis. And you know what, I've used it as a strength and uh, I've been successful at this point. So quite happy to where I'm at, but uh, it's just, it's a barrier that you have to work with on a daily basis. Exactly. And I love how you're using it as a strength to just keep fueling your business and making it even more successful. Um, Sabrina, have you ever had an instance where you had to deal with racism as an entrepreneur in your business and how did it affect how you pursued your career? I have I run into racism and on a daily basis um, in my personal life. Um, I'll react to it. Um, in my personal life, but as a photographer, I'm like Glenn, um, I have to deal with it accordingly because I have to, I, not I have to, I treat my clients with respect. So whoever it is that I'm dealing with, I try to um, show them the respect and rise above the ignorance that's being shown towards me. That's in my professional life. In a personal life, in my personal life, I will react to it. But if I would like to get the customers, I have to show them that I am bigger than them. Um, but if when I do um, respond, it will be in a way that it is um, dignified, that I'm more respectful than what they are. Perfect, thank you so much, Sabrina. I really appreciate that. Um, so I got this second question. And I'm just going to stick with uh, Tia, Nathan, and Glenn, if that's okay for for this next question. Um, how did the pandemic? So Tia, I'll ask you first, of course. Uh, how did the pandemic impact your business? Um, we'll just talk about one business, um, and it wasn't an impact that was bad. Uh, literally, my cleaning company like skyrocketed, where I made one million dollars in 2021. Like I went from losing a lot of residential clients, you guys. But what happened was because there were so many uh, precautionary things going on in commercial, my commercial division skyrocketed. It went up 
because of the pandemic, my cleaners were overly employed. It was, I'm telling you, COVID was lit for Tia and top-notch cleaners. Um, you know, I, I didn't have any problems during the pandemic. Um, and I was able to even, you know, start an organization during the pandemic because I had a little bit more downtime. So it was great for me. I hope that answers the question. Wow, you almost made me fall off my chair when you when you said that. Yeah, Peter. I'm, I'm, I was a, like, I'm in a different tax bracket now, brother. Yeah. <laughs> I love that for you. I love that for you. Uh, Nathan, how did the pandemic impact your business? It was the exact same as what Tia just said. When everything was shut down and people have nowhere to shop, guess where they came to shop? <laughs> so it was the same idea. Like I seen this huge uh, incline of business because people were sitting at home. You know, we had to serve and the, you know, all that coming in. So people had money and they had nowhere to, you know, spend it. They couldn't go to the mall and online shopping was, you know, the, the, the thing that people were doing. So they were coming to me a lot. So I had all this product and I started seeing all these almost everything that I was posting was selling like instantly. So I just started posting as much as I could. So I was doing it all day long, posting constantly. And as soon as I would, you know, upload an item, it was it was sold. So it was very, very good to me. It was it was amazing. It was a very, very good time during during COVID. I mean, for as bad as it was, you know, financially, it was very good. <laughs> That's awesome. I love yes. that. I love that. I remember you posted a couple items on Instagram as well, and uh, I, I was really interested in them. And then by the time I think it was sold, I was like, dang, mm -hmm. it was going quick. So uh, I really yeah. like how you, you've been using You guys were using the pandemic in a good way. I, I, had, um, I had people actually telling me, saying, like, there's no way that it could sell in a minute and a half. You just posted it, like calling me out saying it must <laughs> already be sold. I'm like, I'm telling you, as soon as I post it, there's no time like for anybody to even, you know, say something. But there it was gone just like that. No, oh, man, that's 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 great. That's, that was that's all so I could great. ask for. <laughs> amen. Amen. Um, Glenn. Uh, how did the pandemic impact your business? Well, the pandemic for Carvery's Construction and CGR, we were we were busy. Like um, commercial kind of slowed down because a lot of the government people were home. Um, but you know, when the schools, the, the school board was doing work, so they were took they took every opportunity they could to go in the schools and renovate where they needed to renovate. Um, you know, just before COVID hit, um, basically I had started. Uh, Carvey's Construction built a new building in Burnside, so we're just in the stages of doing the interior fit up, so that worked well, so I had crews available to go do it because we did it underneath our platform. Um, and then in respect to everything else, like we were, we were nonstop, like the work was coming in. So, and we don't do a whole lot of residential, but uh, our residential department, I mean, it skyrocketed. People were home, they were doing work. So um, yeah, we didn't we didn't blink an eye. We just kept on rolling right along. So it was a great opportunity great. for Carver's construction for sure. Like I say, and and then we completed our building six months early. So wow, wow! And you're in that new building now, are you? In that new building, Six Ralston Avenue. If anybody's in the neighborhood, stop by, see it. I'd love to take them on a tour. Yeah, it that looks very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good stuff. I'm glad the pandemic all impacted you guys in a positive way and uh, was good for your guys' business for sure. Um, I have one more question for all of you, and then I have just one question specifically for Glenn, which I think is a really good question that I really want to get answered. Um, so I'll start with you, Tia, for the final question. Um, what was a challenge that you faced in your business and how did you overcome it? Being audited by CRA, that was uh, uh, one of the challenges that I never even seen coming. I'll be honest, if anybody's went through that, um, you know, I'm coming, off of welfare, social assistance, on a brink of homelessness, starting a cleaning company with dollar store supplies. I didn't know my head from my arse. Um, and I didn't know what a contractor was versus a subcontractor versus an employee. I, I, I was excited because I registered a business, but I didn't know that I didn't need to get the CRA number until I hit 30,000. So I had this number and I wasn't doing proper bookkeeping and bang. Um, I got an audit from CRA, forensic audit done, and it took months. So for me, it was, it was probably the worst 
the worst experience I've ever dealt with, especially being a single mother with three kids. Because when you're financially audited and you don't have an incorporated business and you are a sole proprietor, guess what happens? Your personal gets shut down too. So it, it was terrible. Um, and I overcame it because I was like, girl, you've been through hell and back. You've been, you know, all through everything. This is just another barrier that's trying to keep you down, get your head out of your, like your sadness and your silk and, and get back on the game. Do what they need you to do and recreate, you know, your cleaning company and do it right the next time. And ever since that, I got an accountant. Like I'm telling you, I, I crossed my teeth, uh, eyes. Nobody ever wants to go through an audit. Trust me. Yeah, I can only imagine how stressful that was for you and that you probably had to learn so much in such a short period of time. Um, but like, look where you're at now and all the growth that you had over the last few years. So, I mean, kudos to, kudos to you for sure. Um, Nathan, what was the challenge that you faced in your business and how did you overcome it? Um, I think my biggest challenge was when I first started out um, was actually finding out what worked for me as far as, you know, my products. So, you know, I would go out there and I would get a bunch of things that I thought people would want and without doing the research of what people actually wanted or wanted from me. So I would get out there and I'd spend a bunch of money on things that I thought that people would want from me because I saw it selling somewhere else or someone from someone else in the cities or someone who does my line of business. And I was like, all right, cool. I got all the stuff that people want. This is going to be awesome. I start, you know, uploading and and uh, getting these products ready to be uh, purchased and they didn't sell. And I couldn't figure out what was going on and I really had to, you know, reevaluate, you know, my market and do a little bit more research on what people wanted from me. And I think that's the key part is what they wanted from me. They might want those things, but they're going to go somewhere else to get that. So I, I had to go in and, you know, kind of figure out what my client base was like, what they wanted from me, what the price point was like, if there was any people that wanted higher priced items, you know, all of those things were kind of a trial and error for me. And it took some time because I still had to get rid of all the items that I had that were sitting. So I had to get creative in how to sell them and how to, you know, make them more attractive so I could, you know, offload those items and then kind of refocus and restart to get the items that people really, really wanted from me and, you know, get down to the nitty gritty again. So I think that was one of the biggest challenges that I had, you know, in the beginning, because I thought for sure, I was like, I spent all this money, I'm done. I can't, this is not going to work. I kind of wanted to give up, but, you know, I think it was, it was, I had to be persistent and, you know, kind of regroup and, you know, bet on myself and it, it, it ended up working out in the end. So you know, that, that was a hurdle that, that definitely hurt me a little bit, but it made me stronger in the end. Wow, I love that. Bet on yourself. I, I think that that's so important, you know, because mm -hmm. only you know uh, how much you, it, the business means to you and what you can put into it. So that, that's really great. Yeah. Uh, Glenn, same question for you. Uh, what was the challenge that you faced in your business and how did you overcome it? Uh, one of the challenges I had is uh, basically as we were growing and we we're, you know, we seem to be doubling our business every every year. Uh, just filling out contracts. I mean, we, we relied on certain contracts and, you know, uh, we grew in the business side of things. Um, you know, basically we thought we were keeping track of, you know, bid and tenders, uh, making sure everything at our I's were dotted, T's were crossed. And, you know, unfortunately just one year, you know, halfway through my business, you know, 10 years in the business, I made a mistake on a major tender that we relied on. Um, so we didn't get that tender. I basically had to reinvent the wheel. That was back in 1996. And um, at that time I lost a major tender and um, it was a year we got into the road marketing business. Um, I just happened to be, you know, it was a first year for HRM to, to contract out uh, painting all the roads, like all the crosswalks and arrows. Um, I seen that tender and I said to myself, I said, you know what? I lost a major tender. I said, you know what? I'm gonna bid this contract. So I bid it and I received it for both areas. Um, we talk about prejudice. Uh, when I was awarded it, you know, I go to the meeting and they're saying to me like, okay, he's like, they don't do line marketing. And I'm, well, we did, but we did it in parking lots. But we don't know if you can handle it. So, you know, they basically said, well, look, we're not giving you both contracts. We're gonna give you one and get you started. So, you know, it was stressful, you know, so I, I, I took, 
you know, a certain amount of employees, moved them from one area of painting, moved them into the line parking business. Um, you know, we took all the courses, we bought all the machinery, we did every, what HRM wanted, and uh, they were just difficulty and, and awarding both sides. But we started with one side. Uh, within a month or two, they decided to give us the whole thing, and uh, we completed it successfully, and we had it for three years. So I filled that I filled that void that we lost because I think we just got caught up in the growth and we just made a mistake. And uh, but we you know we resolved it and we moved on. We went into a new side of the business in the road marketing. And we're still doing it today, and uh, so it was a positive feedback at the end of the day. But um, but it was still something tough and something you had to work uh, to try and resolve in a short manner, and and we did so. Absolutely, um, that's that's so great. Uh, thank you for those questions uh, to all our panelists. Um, I'm going to wrap up here in a sec, but I just want to do one more question for Glenn, and I think that this question is really important because it kind of pertains to NSCC and a lot of the programs that we have here at NSCC. So the question is, um, how many women in trades do you have hired within your companies? Uh, do you allow work placements as well? And do you, con do you conduct that all in Cape Breton? Um, one of the things we do is uh, we've hired, I mean, over the years, we've probably only had about a dozen different women in different trades. Um, uh, the, most of them have moved on, um, but uh, we've had it in four different trades, like plumbers, uh, uh, carpentry, painting. Um, we just had a lady that was here as a painter. She was here for two years, but uh, she's now going to be a mother, so she's off right now, but she will be coming back. Um, um, on the plumbing, we had two plumbing ladies that were here and they moved on to other companies. Uh, we had a lady carpenter that was here. Um, she was a red seal. Um, she was here for five years and she was coming in from Truro, but uh, didn't want to do the community anymore. So she moved on. Um, but at this time, we're open to that. And, uh, you know, the more the merrier. And I, you like to see that, you know, it's no different than having uh, a uh, black person within the trades, you know, I mean, in my whole company, I mean, we have, I think there's 15 now, but at one time we, we only had four or five. Uh, it's, it's tough to, to see, like you'd like to see more of it, but it's just that it's not there and they're not available. So, but I've got two black gentlemen that are working for me now that work for the competitor. Uh, they met my, my trade guys, like one was a plumber, one was a heating tech, uh, met them in uh, NSCC on their, taking their, you know, you got to do four blocks. They were in their third block and they met my guys and said, oh, I didn't even know Carvey's did that. So anyways, they got talking and next, you know, when they finished their their court, their third semester, they came in, seen me, sat down, interviewed them, I hired them right on the spot. And now they're still working with us today. So yeah, so we, we do support women within the, the trades, but we just like to see more of it. Absolutely, absolutely, and I and I love that, Glenn. Um, you know, especially you you did your schooling at NECC, and you know now your business is so successful. Um, it's really nice that you're able to 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 do that. You know, hire folks from uh, that are women in trades, which is we know not not many um, are, as well as um, you know African Nova Scotians as well into your business. And I think it's important for all the viewers to know that. Um, you know, you can reach out to any of these entrepreneurs and, uh, you know, as long as you conduct yourself professionally and you really are passionate, I'm sure all these entrepreneurs will help you out and give you uh, advice. Um, so just keep that in mind. But uh, listen, I could sit here and talk to you guys for, for, for a long time. Um, you know, you guys have so much knowledge and, and you guys are so beneficial for uh, the community college to be able to know that you guys are alumni and, and doing great things. So I really want to thank each and every one of you uh, for sharing your stories and your experiences, uh, you know, on behalf of NSEC and our students, our faculty, our alumni, our management and executive team. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I want to thank everyone who came together to put this event on. Of course, it's the third annual Ask Black Entrepreneur event. I can't believe it's been three years already since we started this uh, back in 2021 during the pandemic. Um, you know, I want to thank IT, uh, marketing, communications, entrepreneurship and alumni. Uh, and of course, everybody uh, tuning in and supporting this. You know, we thank you so, so much. And um, for those who are students or graduates of NSCC, 
Um, please don't forget to complete the feedback survey uh, to be entered in for a draw for our alumni gift boxes. Uh, the survey link will be posted in the chat. That's it. That's all I have for everybody. Uh, thank you so much um, for everybody. You guys were phenomenal. Thank you so much to all the entrepreneurs. You know, I really, really appreciate this. And uh, I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. All right, so, all right you too. Right, thank thank you. you guys. All right. All right. Thank you.